Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this seminar, which forms part of the AIP Theoretical Physics Seminar Series for 2021. I'm David Tilbrook from the Department of Fundamental and Theoretical Physics at ANU, and I'm hosting this series of seminars on behalf of the AIP Theoretical Physics Group. Uh, I need to start by acknowledging the people of the Ngunnawal Nation on whose traditional lands we are located here at ANU. And of course, we also acknowledge the traditional owners of lands all around Australia. We'd like to pay our respects to their leaders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge Murray Batchelor and the other members of the organising committee who have donated their time to identify um, interesting topics in theoretical physics and and uh, related er uh, areas for this series of seminars. Um, Murray is also the chair of the theoretical physics group within the AIP. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in theoretical physics, you are most welcome to join that group. Uh, it's free to all um, members of the Australian Institute of Physics, of course. And if you want to join, just uh, log into the membership portal on the AIP website and you'll see the theoretical physics group name under the topical groups in the membership profile, and you can join there. We would be very happy to see you. Uh, so far in this series of talks, we've had seminars from uh, Professor Tracy Slatia from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology on dark matter from Professor, Ramos Volker, uh, Professor Raymond Volkus at the University of Melbourne, who talked about the Fermi results from the uh, recent Fermilab G2 G minus two experiment and its possible consequences for the future of the standard model of particle physics. And we've had a talk from Professor Susan Coppersmith from the University of New South Wales on quantum stochastic resonance. If you miss those talks or you would like to see them again, they're available to watch on the AIP YouTube channel. Today's speaker is uh, Emeritus Professor Gerard Milburn from the University of Queensland. Gerard, of course, needs no introduction. He's been a leader of Australian theoretical physics for many decades. He is the recipient of the Moyel Medal for Mathematical Physics in 2001 and the recipient of the BOAS Medal in 2003. He is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the American Physical Society, and he was elected a member of the Royal Society in 2017. Gerard has made many very important contributions to theoretical physics in areas such as quantum information theory, quantum control and measurement, fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics, and of course, to quantum optics. Um, and, and all of this work, of course, feeds into the new and emerging field of quantum engineered systems, just to name a few. As probably you are aware, he's also the co-author of the book with Dan Walls uh, on, by the name Quantum Optics which I think many people rightly regard as the definitive text on that subject and certainly deserves a place in your personal library if you're working in the field of quantum optics or a related area. Um, I think it was in the mid nineties uh, that Gerard gave a talk at Macquarie University and it was one of the most memorable talks that I have attended. Um, and he talked about things like, I don't know if you remember this Gerard, the energy eigenstate of the universe. And you mentioned the problem of nature, the, the, the nature, the problem of time and its nature in quantum mechanics. And today's talk, it seems, has a somewhat similar theme. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Gerard Milburn's contribution to this series of talks with a seminar, with a seminar entitled The Thermodynamics of Clocks. Over to you, please, Gerard. All right. Thanks, David and Murray, for inviting me to uh, give this talk. Uh, the title of the talk might sound a little dry, but as David mentioned, I've long been interested in time in physics, uh, in quantum physics and uh, general relativity. And, you know, much has been written about the nature of time, probably since the Greeks started thinking about it. But about four years ago, I decided that perhaps a more productive direction would be to study very carefully how clocks are used to coordinate coincidences and thus the thermodynamics of clocks. So let me begin. Uh, oops, why is this not going forward? Oh, hang on, there we go. So here's a uh, summary of the talk. I'm first going to uh, give a discussion of the thermodynamics of periodic 
classical clocks. Then I'm going to talk about non-periodic thermal clocks. It might sound slightly oxymoronic, but you'll see what I mean in a minute. Then I'm going to switch to the case of quantum clocks, which are driven by information, driven by measurement itself as a fuel. And these devices can run at close to zero temperature and then draw some uh, conclusions and some hints at how we can understand the Ravelli cone thermal time hypothesis for how to uh, solve or at least attempt to solve the problem of time in quantum gravity. So let me begin. The first thing I want to make absolutely clear is that in physics, time is a purely relational phenomenon. It's, uh, you know, most physicists, particularly theoretical physics, think that time is little t in the equations, but nothing could be further from the truth. What clocks actually measure are coincidences between local events here and now. And uh, here and now is, is a shorthand for saying that uh, clocks are always local and time as indicated by clocks is always local. Indeed, we have to specify the local environment very carefully if we're to correctly describe how clocks operate, which includes specifying the temperature of the environment. We also have to make sure the clock doesn't interact at all, or at least very little, with the systems we're trying to measure. Uh, the question of the temperature of the local environment is critical in general relativity when one looks at thermodynamics of, uh, of general relativistic systems, one needs to take into account the Tolman relations. And most importantly of all, a clock record is a count. It's an integer. It's a dimensionless quantity. Uh, essentially, we just count the number of ticks between one physical event coincident with the clock count and another physical event coincident with a later clock count. So here's a couple of examples of clocks. On the left is a periodic clock, which is Huygens' pendulum clock from 1673. Complicated looking device. It's driven by a falling mass, which is not indicated here, but it's it falls and drives all this series of gears and sprockets and all the rest of it, which kicks the pendulum from time to time and uh, keeps it going. So that's a periodic clock. And we're all very familiar with a non-periodic clock. And I've just indicated here a, a sort of picture of carbon-14 as an, as an emblem of uh, radiocarbon dating. But there are lots of non-periodic clocks that have been used throughout history. Um, hourglasses, Galileo used a water clock. Um, candles that slowly burn down. These are all non-periodic clocks. Okay, so let me talk about clocks in complete generality. The simplest thing to be said about the thermodynamics of clocks is to note that all clocks, classical and quantum, are irreversible systems pushed away from thermal equilibrium. This is the essential feature of a clock. And in essence, what we're watching is a system trying to reestablish thermal equilibrium. The simplest way to determine how far it's pushed away from thermal equilibrium is in terms of the free energy, which changes by changes in internal energy and by heat, or in this case, entropy. So there are two ways to drive a clock, push it away from thermal equilibrium. You can do work on it to increase the internal energy. That's what happens in a pendulum clock with the falling mass. Or you can make measurements to decrease the entropy. And that, as I'll show shortly, is what happens in irreversible thermal clocks. And I wrote a review on this last year. So if, if any of this seems obscure, it might, it might help. That there might be further discussion you can look at in that paper. So here's the classic work-driven clock. It's a pendulum clock. There's a falling mass. And the pendulum is the primary oscillator, which, if it doesn't uh, deviate too far from the vertical, is basically a linear harmonic oscillator. But the overall device is anything but linear because of the ratchet or the anchor and pivot wheel at the top to which it is attached. And that's what periodically kicks the pendulum. And it's the coupling between that ratchet and the pendulum which makes the total device highly nonlinear, a driven nonlinear system. And in fact, it's driven towards a non-equilibrium steady state. It's not a stationary state. It's in fact a limit cycle or a one-dimensional attractor. Sometimes these are called uh, relaxation oscillations or self-sustained oscillations. But the key point is that the inter interaction between damping, driving, and nonlinearity enables a stable limit cycle to form. So here's an example. Uh, in dimensionless units, here's the equations of the pendulum. So x dot is y. So x is, say, the deviation from the vertical, and y is the angular momentum. 
So the linear part of this here without the damping is just the harmonic oscillator equations in motion. Then there's frictional damping minus gamma y. Then there's this forcing term, which is coming from the uh, interaction between the pendulum and the crown and anchor wheel. And you can see it, it's a nonlinear function of the canonical coordinates of the pendulum itself. And later I will include this quantum Langevin force, sorry, not quantum Langevin, classical Langevin force to uh, take account of the thermodynamics. So here I've essentially assumed that the, uh, the ratchet or the kick function that describes the anchor wheel is just a single function of nonlinear function of the canonical coordinates. This basically assumes that the damping of the anchor wheel is very rapid compared to any other dissipative time scale in the problem, largely due to friction when the hammers hit the various spokes of the wheel. So here's the nonlinear function. Uh, there's a amplitude mu, which has units of frequency. Then there's a sine function, just gives plus one if the argument is positive and negative and minus one if the argument is negative. It's a linear combination of X and Y. And what that linear combination is depends on the details of the design of the anchor wheel. So here's an ex example. I just uh, ignore noise for the moment, put that into a simulator in Mathematica and plot the long time oscillations of the angular momentum and the kick function as a function of position and angular momentum. And there you'll see it's moved on to the limit cycle. Uh, there are initial transients which die away, but now it's well and truly on the limit cycle. So that's, that's why the clock works. Now the reason it's called the limit cycle is that if it, any amount of friction pushes it off the limit cycle towards the origin, it'll move back onto the limit cycle. And so the limit cycle is stable and small fluctuations will always push it back onto the limit cycle. And that's why limit cycles are the key to making good stable clocks. Now, the way a limit cycle forms is that the work done by the drive, the falling mass in this case, equals the energy dissipated on each cycle. So we can write down expression for the energy of a simple harmonic oscillator in these dimensionless units, then get an equation of motion of that. And you see it has two terms. There's a frictional term proportional to essentially the kinetic energy, uh, which is a decay term. And then there's this function here, which represents the work done by the kicking mechanism. So the first term is energy dissipated and the last term is work done by the drive. And in understanding the thermodynamics of clocks, it's the interplay between those two terms that matters. So if you integrate around one cycle of the limit cycle, and in this case, there's no noise, so every cycle is the same, then the energy dissipated, which is that integral on the left there, is equal to the work done on the cycle. So the larger the limit cycle, the greater power that will be dissipated. Uh, large limit cycles mean Y can get very large amplitudes, uh, and so the dissipated energy is large. It's better, I think, to understand what's going on here by moving to polar coordinates. So I'm going to assume we're on the limit cycle and move to new coordinates r and theta. In these coordinates, the energy is just half the radius. Uh, actually, it should be half the radius squared. But in terms of these coordinates, the, uh, the radial variable just has a decay term minus gamma r12 and a kicking term, which is driving it, which is uh, linear in the coordinates. And the angular term just has a frequency term minus one. In the units I'm using, the frequency is, is one and an offset in the frequency coming from the design of the clock. So clearly there's a fixed point of fixed radius when dr dt is zero and mu is the driving strength. So by driving it harder, we can get a bigger limit cycle. Now, when we include noise, uh, we include noise, we need to take account of what the, the fluctuating Langevin forces do and while they're easy to write down in the canonical coordinates, transforming to these uh, polar coordinates is, is a nonlinear transformation, and you need to be extremely careful about how you do the transformation. So here I'm going, this is a technical detail, I'm, going, I'm using the ETO stochastic differential equation systems. Uh, and this is what they are. So first of all, you see the fixed point of the radial coordinate is modified a little bit. D is a diffusion constant, which is essentially proportional to temperature. That just comes from the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And W1 and W2 are independent Wiener increments, which is just a fancy way of saying it's a diffusion process. 
But the most important thing I want you to take away from this is what occurs in the equation for the angle. So the noise in the angle is certainly proportional to the square root of the diffusion constant as it should be, but you'll notice it's also inversely proportional to the radial coordinate of the limit cycle. And this is why limit cycles are so extremely important uh, in many areas of physics, but particularly clocks, because the larger the limit cycle, the smaller is the rate of phase noise in the clock. So to make a good clock, you've got to try and get uh, either D as small as possible, which means reducing the temperature, or you have to um, make the limit cycle large and slow down the rate of phase diffusion on the limit cycle. In particular, if I just assume it's on the limit cycle and linearize the phase noise on the limit cycle, I just get a single equation for the phase, which has a systematic term and a diffusive term. Uh, so the point to take away from this is the phase noise gets smaller the larger the limit cycle. So here's some stochastic simulations of the kick function, uh, taking into account the phase diffusion. Um, I think I've got three, three simulations here, and you can see, clearly see the effect of phase diffusion causes successive realizations of, of the oscillation to gradually uh, get out of sync with each other. So the noise coming in, in this case, purely thermal noise, which is necessary if the thing is damped, as it must be to reach a limit cycle, uh, by the fluctuation dissipation, if it's damped, there has to be noise. It leads to phase noise in the oscillation. Uh, and the point is that the period fluctuates from cycle to cycle. Now we can actually estimate what the distribution of that is. This is called an inverse uh, diffusion process. Basically we want to, in the usual diffusion process, you say, how far does it get in time T? Here we want to know how long does it take to get to theta equals two pi. And this is something called the inverse Gaussian distribution or Weyl distribution, there it is. Uh, perhaps it's better if I put down the mean and variance of the period. Uh, the mean of the period is two pi on omega, which is what it should be when the clock is designed properly. Omega is, is fixed by the pendulum, maybe small offsets due to the interaction with the anchor wheel. But the key point is the variance in the period. You'll see it depends on the diffusion constant D, but it's also inversely proportional to the radial, or the, the actual size of the limit cycle. So again, we see by making the limit cycle really big, the period becomes better defined. Uh, now this feature coming out here that all clocks are necessarily dissipative and good, good clocks are particularly dissipative uh, has turned up in the recent literature in quantum information. There's this very nice part, paper by Erke et al, uh, which discusses a, a fairly abstract quantum uh, model of a clock, but it essentially gets to the same result. So here's a picture of the distribution as we decrease the noise going from left to right in those three curves. I've chosen the frequency equal to one, so the period is two pi. And you can see what happens as the noise is decreased, the period becomes more sharply peaked on what it should be, two pi in, in this case. Now let's look at the fluctuations in the period and the fluctuations in the work. Just to remind you that we can easily write down an expression for the energy dissipated and the work done, and these are equal on the limit cycle. But of course, if the period fluctuates, these integrals fluctuate in their values. So if the period fluctuates, the work fluctuates, as does the energy dissipated. And so here I've run 50 sample trajectories looking at the, uh, the work done in the first half cycle uh, of the limit cycle. And you can see they're pretty stochastic, they fluctuate. But you'll notice that when the period is small, the work dissipated is small. And when the period is large, the work dissipated is large. So there's a very uh, simple relationship between fluctuations in the period and fluctuations in the work and the mean period and the mean work, work done. And in essence, this is the key message of classical thermodynamics of clocks. The period is a random variable and that implies the work done in energy dissipated is also a random variable but they're related to each other in this linear way. Okay, so that's enough of periodic clocks. Now let me turn to a non-periodic clock, and this is going to be a thermal clock. Imagine that you have some two-level system, either a two-level atom or a spin system in thermal thermodynamic equilibrium with a bath at temperature T. Uh, it can make transitions from the ground state, to the excited state, and then decay back to the ground state. 
excitations occur at a rate gamma plus and decays occur at a rate gamma minus. And now I can go in, in principle at least, and make accurate measurements of the energy of this system. That is to say, if I'm looking at one particular atomic system from the ensemble that's in thermodynamic equilibrium, I can make accurate measurements and try and catch it in the act of jumping backwards and forwards. And because I'm measuring energy, uh, this is going to reduce the entropy of the system. As soon as you look at it uh, and see it's in the excited state, well, its entropy is, is zero, as long as you're confident about the, the measurement, even though, of course, the ensemble entropy is a minimum. Uh, sorry, a maximum, the free energy is a minimum. But the imp other important point to note is that energy measurements will not change thermodynamic equilibrium in this problem because it's, it, it's, uh, it's stationary. Uh, in the energy. This is described, I mean, it could give a quantum description, but it's hardly necessary here. Just give a birth death master equation describing the populations in the ground and excited state. Uh, the populations have to sum to one. So the rate of change of population in the ground state, or in this case, probability in the ground state, is minus the rate of change of the probability of the excited state. The decay rate has this plus one in it, indicating spontaneous emission. And the excitation rate depends on the amount of thermal quanta in the heat bath at the frequency of the atom. This is just the usual uh, uh, Bose Einstein st uh, statistical term here. And gamma is the spontaneous emission rate, which can be written in dimensionless terms by taking the ratio of gamma to the frequency of the atom. Uh, it's basically the fine structure constant plus some things that depend on the kind of atom that you've got. And beta, of course, is the inverse temperature. Uh, but that doesn't describe what you see. If you're measuring the atom, what you see is a random telegraph process. Sometimes it's in the ground state, sometimes in the excited state, and it keeps jumping backwards and forwards. So we can now write down a stochastic differential equation for the observed process. And you can see it's made up of two conditional Poisson processes, one corresponding transitions from uh, minus one to plus one, and one corresponding transitions from plus one to minus one. And the average of those Poisson processes are just given by the relevant decay rates which de and excitation rates, which depend on temperature. To cut a long story short, here's a simulation for particular choices of the parameters. On the left-hand side, I've plotted the uh, one plus ZT on two, which is ZT goes from minus one to plus one, so this goes from zero to one. And you can see it making transitions between the ground and excited state at random times. The count of this clock is just counting the number of transitions. And there you can see it sort of stepping up as you go. So to make this a clock, you just count the number of transitions. That's just an integer, a dimensionless quantity. So how do you back out the time from that? Well, let's look at the semi-classical limit where the temperature is much bigger than h bar omega a. In that limit, you count transitions n. Then you estimate a time that's elapsed, tau estimate in the standard units of seconds, by taking the number of counts that have occurred and dividing it by the, the rate gamma. In this limit, the, uh, the downward transitions and the upward transitions occur in the same rate at the classical limit. But there's a very interesting feature here. When you actually put in the expression for gamma in this, in this classical limit, you see it also requires knowing the temperature of the bath. So you need to have an estimate of the bath temperature in order to uh, get the right units for this clock. Of course, you don't have to use seconds. If you don't want to, you can just use n. And I'll come back to that in, uh, towards the end of the talk. But if you want to use seconds, you need to estimate the temperature. Which leads to a curious feature. That is, there's a kind of duality between time and temperature in this problem. So the product of the estimated time and the estimated temperature is, in fact, a universal constant for a given atom. Boltzmann's constant, Planck's constant, frequency of the atom divided by gamma, which is a dimensionless constant that describes a particular atom. That implies an uncertainty relation for these estimates, which tells you that the sum of the fractional uncertainties is zero. And for those of you that know about general relativity and thermodynamics with general relativity, you'll recognize this as a kind of Tolman relation, which is true for any thermal clock. Okay, now I'm going to turn to quantum periodic clocks. So let's imagine that uh, we have this particular system. I'm going to base it on something called collective resonance fluorescence. Way, way back in 1954, Dickey uh, pointed out that if you have a number of atoms 
in a region uh, small compared to the wavelength of the light in this cavity, then they, they essentially become like a phase dipole array and will undergo collective spontaneous emission, emitting a pulse uh, with, with a rate that scales as the square of the number of atoms rather than just the number of atoms, which would be the case if there was no collective emission. So that's a well understood phenomenon, been observed many, many times. But here I'm interested in something called res collective resonance fluorescence. So I take the same Dickey system, but now drive the atoms with a laser. And uh, there's a reference there to paper by Peter Drummond, which I think has the best discussion of the quantum physics of this kind of system. It's a highly nonlinear system, as I'll show in a minute. It's driven and it's damped. So it looks like a good place to start to build a clock. Can be described in terms of these collective angular momentum operators, which are built out of the sort of pseudo spin uh, representation using the ground and excited state of this two level system. The total angular momentum quantum number is given by half the number of atoms in the cavity, and typically that's thousands, of course. Uh, now, the standard quantum optics of this is to write down a master equation describing the density operator for that collection of atoms. There's a term proportional to omega, which represents the work done by the laser trying to force these atoms to precess around the X direction on the block sphere. And there's a collective decay term. This is, again, it's just the spontaneous emission rate. So here, all the atoms are trying to decay to the ground state uh, in this highly collective, organized way. From this, you can write down the semi-classical equations for the mean values of J plus, which is just Jx plus Ijy. And to get the semi-classical equations, you just factorize everything. If you stick these in here, you don't get uh, first order moments, first order moments, couple to second order moments, and, co and, uh, and so on. But if you factorize everything, you get the semi-classical equations. They can be solved. It turns out there's a fixed point for, for, for low driving. In fact, no driving. The fixed point is every atom in the ground state. So Jz is minus n on two. But as you crank up the driving, there's a critical driving given by gamma n on two, above which that fixed point becomes unstable and a limit cycle is created. This is what it looks like on the limit cycle for semi-classical dynamics. It's precessing purely in the yz plane. And um, the angular variable is a nonlinear function of time. But if you're well above threshold, so omega is much, much bigger than omega naught, a is approximately 0, b is approximately 1, and omega is approximately big omega. So this is just telling you well above the bifurcation point. It's just precessing around the x direction at the Rabi frequency due to the driving laser. Now, let's look for the limit cycle in the quantum case. That was the semi-classical dynamics. We won't see that if we do this problem in a fully quantum way. So we just write down the master equation and we solve it. And we discover that above the hopped bifurcation, we see nothing like a limit cycle. We see the oscillations in Jz slowly decaying. And so there's no limit cycle apparent in this unconditional ensemble average sense. So how do we get the limit cycle out of this? Well, the point is you have to look for it. If you want to see the limit cycle, you must make a phase dependent measurement of this system. And this is where measurement enters critically in the definition of a quantum clock. So the phase dependent measurement I'm going to do here is something called hermodyne detection, which means I look at the field coming out radiated by the atoms from this cavity. I split off a little bit of the laser phase shifted and mix it with the radiated field on a beam splitter and then send it to a photo detector. So this is just hermodyne detection where there's this beam across the bottom here is a local oscillator. And I'm going to do the calculation in the limit where the cavity is poor uh, so that the light comes out fairly rapidly. Now, how do you describe the dynamics of a quantum system conditioned on a measurement record? Uh, you all probably I mean in elementary quantum treatments, you wave your arms around and talk about the projection postulate, but that won't do here because we have a continuous time record uh, of the measurement result. Uh, many people looked at this some years ago, including myself and Howard Wiseman, and, and it's done using something called the stochastic master equation. So here's a way in which it works. There are two things going on here. There's a quantum source, which uh, is described by, by the quantum state of the atoms in the cavity, and there's a measurement record, which is continually being incremented at every time step dt, and that's perfectly classical. It's stochastic. 
obviously, uh, because it's a quantum source. So when we get an update to the measurement record, that has to recondition the quantum state to be consistent with that, which then reconditions the, the probability distributions for observing the next increment in the measurement record. And that, that link goes round and round and round. And this dotted line here is meant to indicate the boundary between the quantum source and the classical measurement record. So this is going to get a bit technical, but I'll just put it down here. Some may be interested in it. The actual current you measure is given by a conditional average of the field emitted in the cavity. In this case, it's just proportional to the dipole, the collective dipole. This little C here is to remind you that it's a conditional average. I'll explain that in a minute. And there's a noise term added coming from the noise on the local oscillator, if you like, or just the fundamental quantum noise that must be there due to the uncertainty principle. You can now write down a conditional stochastic master equation to compute these conditional averages. And here it is. The first bit looks like the ordinary master equation, but now there's this very interesting nonlinear term that's proportional to the white noise process or the diffusion process. This super operator H is defined here, and you can see that it's not linear in the density operator for the system. And there are two ways to understand that. One is, well, that's coming from the fact that when you measure something, you have to recondition and renormalize the uh, probability distributions for the next time increment. But the other way to think about it is that it can't be linear because it has to be history dependent. What you see in the future in the measurement record has to be consistent with what you've seen in the past. And that necessarily means an equation has to be history dependent. And this is how it does it through that nonlinearity. So the details of this, this description is in uh, the book that Howard Wiseman and I wrote 10 or so years ago. Anyway, here's, here's a picture. Here I've plotted the semi-classical limit cycle oscillations, that's the blue curve, and a full quantum simulation of the stochastic master equation computing the conditional mean of Jz. And you can see for 10 atoms, they, they're not too bad, but I think you can also see there's some amplitude and phase fluctuations going on in that oscillation. So, we don't see decaying oscillations that we would have done if we'd ensemble averaged over all the different realizations of that quantum phase diffusion. We see a steady oscillation, but one subject to noise due entirely to the act of measurement itself, or if you like, because you can't measure the system if it doesn't decay out of the cavity, uh, this is a noise due to the fact that the system is undergoing spontaneous emission. The phase diffusion rate gets really small as you make the number of atoms big, which is not surprising. That's when it's supposed to be semi-classical. And the energy dissipation rate goes as n as well. So the limit cycle here is driven by quantum noise at zero temperature. It's not, sorry, the phase diffusion, I should say, is driven by quantum noise at zero temperature. It's not driven by thermal noise at all. It's intrinsic quantum fluctuations that determine the, uh, the phase diffusion, or in alternative language, the line width of this oscillatory signal. Now, how do you get a clock out of this? Well, we just take the sine of that function, add one and multiply by 0.5, and we get this uh, step function. Here's a couple of simulations for n equals 16. And again, you see now fluctuations in the period arising, this time due entirely to quantum fluctuations. What about the energy dissipated? Well, that's just given by the collective spontaneous emission rate, which is given by uh, this time integral of the conditional mean of J plus J minus, there it is there. I've plotted it together with the clock signal and you can see it's going up in sort of not quite steps, it's smoothed out here because of the phase diffusion. But you can see that both the periods are fluctuating as is the work done over each period or the energy dissipated over each period. Here for some, it just happened to give a really long period for the last uh, oscillation and so the energy dissipated was large. So again, we see, just like we saw in the classical case, that the period of each cycle is a random variable, as is the work done and the energy dissipated, but the two are related to each other. The longer the period, the longer the energy, the, the uh, greater the energy that is dissipated. Okay, um, now how do you make this a really good clock? Well. As I've indicated, the phase diffusion gets small as you increase the number of atoms. So let's look at three samples, three stochastic uh, simulations of what I just showed. 
On the far left is n equals 16, and you can see that they begin to vary quite quickly after the first couple of periods. But as you increase the number of atoms, the fluctuations in period and therefore fluctuations in energy dissipated and work done is becoming smaller and smaller. So you can make this a better and better clock just by increasing the number of atoms, which as I indicated, is also increasing the rate of energy dissipation in this system. So all quantum clocks have this feature. Of course, many of you will be familiar with the quantum clock that we usually call a laser. Uh, it's not normally thought of as a clock, but it is a clock. It, uh, it, the semi-classical description shows that it undergoes a bifurcation from a fixed point to a limit cycle above the laser threshold. Uh, we don't normally think of it as a clock because at optical frequencies, the frequency is too high to count, and you need all sorts of tricks to try and bring that frequency down to something that you can count, uh, such as mode locking or locking it to a, an atomic resonance line or something like that. But all quantum clocks are like this. Now, in practice, of course, you'll never be at zero temperature. There'll always be some finite temperature and there'll always be some other source of noise. So in general, you may not reach this quantum limit to the noise. Furthermore, I should emphasize that this is based on a particular kind of decay mechanism based on ordinary old spontaneous emission into a heat bath. Uh, you could come up with some interesting ideas for better clocks by engineering the heat bath itself and engineering how the system is coupled to the heat bath. And uh, people, of course, have realized this with the case of a laser trying to get line widths below the shallow towns line width by very cleverly engineering the environment into which the laser is damped. But I won't say anything more about that. Here, I want to just quickly mention now that we've started some experiments to demonstrate these fundamental limits on clocks at the University of Queensland. This is funded by FQXI, the Foundational Quantum Institute, and also EQUIS, the AST Center for Engineered Quantum Systems. So it's a superconducting system. Uh, if you haven't seen these things before, basically the cavity is a microwave cavity and it's uh, constructed by putting metal onto a silicon substrate. So in the bottom here, you see these grayish lines. These are looking down on metallized pieces sitting on the substrate. And you see we put an AC drive on the central conductor. You can think of this as a cross section through a coaxial cable if you like. The two level system we're going to use to, uh, to lock this system is called a transmon qubit. It's a superconducting qubit with a Josephson junction. Uh, it's called a transmon because it has very, very large capacitive coupling and that makes it um, a, a very linear dispersion relation for the, for the frequency of the qubit as a function of the energy. Uh, these little gaps here uh, gaps in the metal, they're basically just capacitors, but they fulfill the role in microwave cavities that mirrors do in quantum optics. These two outside uh, bits of metal are the ground planes. So you get an ele electric field oscillating in the plane between the ground plane and the central conductor, and of course a magnetic field circulating around the central conductor. So we drive the cavity with a microwave field, and we also drive the qubit, or the transmon, the dipole, if you like, very large dipole uh, with, with, a, with a microwave field. The field is then emitted and we send it through, well, this is a kind of amplifier, a very low noise amplifier called Josephson parametric amplifier. And then it's mixed with a local oscillator coming from the drive laser, uh, the, 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 the drive microwave source for the cavity. And so here we're just doing standard hamadine detection. Actually, you can do heterodyne detection with the system with a non-degenerate Josephson parametric amplifier. And then you do analog to digital conversion to get the clock signal, and then you can start analyzing it. Here we've indicated the possibility that we might want to do some feedback experiments in the future by switching the measured signal back in to modulate the um, driving of the qubit. So that experiment is done the way. Let me just say a few things about it. Here's this one an example of the semi-classical limit cycle for this system. It's quite complicated. Uh, the dashed line there is the in-phase quadrature amplitude, quadrature phase polarization of the qubit, and y of t is the quadrature phase amplitude of the cavity field. So you can see that the polarization is undergoing considerable contortions, but the cavity field is just tracking it in a nice oscillatory way. 
Uh, here's some simulations of what the homodyne conditional stochastic limit cycle looks like. You see pretty much what I've already described, a limit cycle at exactly the right frequency with a lot of noise in phase and amplitude. And you can construct, extract the clock signal from that. And here's the histogram of clock period um, statistics. It's spread out. In this case, uh, it has a period, it, it, its mean is roughly where it should be according to the semi-classical limit cycle and the fluctuations are due to pure quantum noise in this system because we haven't got any thermal noise. It's all coming from the measurement itself or spontaneous emission. Um, so we hope to get that experiment. Arkady Fedorov and Eric Hay at the University of Queensland are building that experiment right now. Should get some results towards the end of the year. Uh, actually, this is an even more interesting system than just extracting ordinary old periodic clock. We can really drive the system very strongly and get into a regime where the rate of information extraction is the fastest rate in the system. And now we get to what's called the quantum jump regime at zero temperature, where we can actually see the transmon qubit undergoing irreversible sort of quick transitions from, from its brown to its excited state. And so by turning one knob, which is the strength of the driving laser, we can move from a periodic clock to a non-periodic clock, this time not a thermal clock but one driven entirely by spontaneous emission, but nonetheless a random clock in the same sense that I discussed before, that is to say it's driven by decreases in entropy from the measurement record itself. Okay, there's another way to do uh, feedback in, I mean, measurement-based feedback is used a lot in building clocks. Uh, and in the classical case, all feedback is measurement-based feedback. In the quantum case, there's a distinction between measurement-based feedback and something called irreversible coherent feedback. So for example, you don't need to measure the microwave field that's coming out of the cavity. You can put it through a circulator and just feed it straight back in. And this leads to a new kind of quantum clock called the coherent feedback clock. And uh, myself and a colleague at UQ, Leo, uh, have worked out the theory for having a master ring cavity coupled to a nonlinear cavity with a current nonlinearity using coherent feedback protocols to construct a very low temperature stable quantum clock. That same system can be realized in superconducting devices replacing the current nonlinearity with the Josephson junction uh, nonlinear inductance. Uh, and in fact, uh, Marbucci's group at Stanford have elaborated uh, considerably on these ideas from clocks to look at how they would impact uh, machine learning for perceptrons and all sorts of uh, interesting uh, protocols based on deep learning networks that would uh, naturally arise at low temperature. If you try to build a classical deep learning machine at zero temperature, it just won't work because it just you can't learn if there's no noise. It's a long story, which I haven't got time to explain. But the quantum clock, the, the uh, things based on quantum noise like quantum clocks would work just fine. Okay, so let me finish now with a quick discussion of Rivelli's thermal time hypothesis, which is a pretty exotic thing. It's an attempt to solve a problem in quantum gravity, and that is the problem of time. So general covariance implies that the time coordinate is not a physical time. Actually, none of the coordinates are physical anything. They're, they're essentially just ways of keeping track of coincidences. But certainly the time coordinate is not a physical time. Actually, it's not a physical time in any physics, as I tried to indicate before, that all time is relational. But it's particularly acute in general relativity because if you try to quantize the system using standard canonical theory, the, the equation of motion is not really an equation of motion. It just says that the geometry of some cosmology is such that its quantum state is the zero energy eigenstate, which is deeply mysterious. Um, so the resolution, of course, is to take seriously the fact that physical time is relational, as it is in ordinary classical general relativity and look for a special physical subsystem that can act as a clock. So the question is, what is the special physical subsystem? Well, the key point is to realize that all clocks are necessary localized subsystems, and they're used to coordinate coincidences. So we're back to the notion that time is what clocks pleasure and clocks are always local. So here was Rivelli's solution to the finding the local subsystem. He said any system in local thermodynamic equilibrium can function as a clock. Uh, it was a fairly abstract uh, idea. He said, well, let's suppose you have some system, say a bunch of two-level atoms in thermodynamic equilibrium or some complicated radiation field in thermodynamic equilibrium with a gravitational field of a planet or something, a star. Uh, you write down 
the Gibbs Boltzmann distribution for that uh, and then take the log of that to define a Hermitian operator. And that emission operator can now be used to define a map on all physical quantities cause, cause the thermal called a thermal flow. There it is there, all very formal. So the Hamiltonian here, you've got the log of bro, whatever that means. And from this, you can show that there's a connection between thermal flow time and shredding at time T, where the inverse temperature plays a key role. And there's a funny little paper by Ravelli and Smurlach. That's not really funny, but it's kind of intriguing because they interpret beta as the speed of time in this uh, in this thermal problem. So all that's extremely formal. What, what can it possibly mean? Well, here's, here's a way to construct a clock. So imagine we have two non-local observers um, in thermodynamic equilibrium with a common bath T. Each observer is, of course, local and uses whatever they want for its local time measurements. Uh, and temperature measurements. They have their own standards for time and temperature. They don't have to be the same, uh, but the two atoms have to be identical. And so the question is, can they use local thermal clocks to establish that they share a global thermal environment, even though they may be using different standards for local time and temperature measurements? The answer is yes, and here's how you do it. You first of all agree that, sorry, you first of all have to say that A and B will agree that one unit of local thermal time, cor thermal time corresponds to N transitions in their local thermal clock. Of course, N is a random variable, uh, as we've seen before for these kind of th uh, thermal clocks, but they will agree that after 20 transitions, one unit of time has elapsed. Now, the way it works is that observer A waits for one unit of time to pass, that is N transitions on her local thermal clock and sends a signal to B. I'm neglecting the decay times. Upon receiving the signal, B waits for one unit of his local thermal time clock and sends a signal back to A, during which time, of course, A's clock has ticked on another NA prime transitions on her local clock. But you can show that up to the uncertainty due to the nature of Poisson statistics, these systems will be in thermal equilibrium if the ratio of NA to NA prime is approximately equal to one. The error is the standard uh, shot noise, or in this case, Poisson limit. So as long as N is big enough, as long as they agree that the unit of time is due to many, many, many transitions, they will be able to come to a, a conclusion that they are interacting with a common thermal heat bath using these thermal clocks. So they have local clocks, they can be synchronized, and they can be used to establish the fact that they're coupled to a local thermal bath. In fact, the Ravelli thermal time hypothesis is much more general than that. It's not really a, a thermal time hypothesis, it's really a time hypothesis. And this is contained in this beautiful paper by Ravelli and Cohn. Uh, it turns out that even at zero temperature, you can build a clock like this. So any local system in a global field ground state can be used as a clock. So an example of this is a two level atom in the vacuum state. Let's just assume it's Minkowski space for now. A, a, an atom in the ground state, in the ground state of the electromagnetic field. Uh, but as soon as I go in and locally give that atom a kick and excite it into the excited state, it's now no longer a stationary state of atom plus field. It rapidly evolves into an entangled state between the state of the atom and the field. And of course, that is the origin of spontaneous emission. So it's not too surprising that you can build a zero temperature quantum clock to implement this scheme of Ravelli and Cohn. And in fact, the super radiant clock I just described, you can think of it as a local quench plus measurement, and the drive is the local quench, and the measurement is a local measurement. And a lot of work has been done on this recently. The idea comes from an old idea from uh, Shredniski long ago called the Energy Eigenstate Thermalization Hypothesis. And now with the incredible control that quantum technology has given us over, say, trapped ions, you can use this to show how um, thermalization will occur if you have a many body system in one of its energy eigenstates and you go in and locally excite one part of the many body system, it will immediately become entangled, it won't be in a stationary state. And as far as that local system is concerned, it will look to all measurement purposes as if it's interacting with a thermal uh, heat bath even though the whole system is in fact at zero temperature. Okay, so let me come to my conclusions. Uh, what I've discussed is the 
the simple fact that all clocks are dissipative systems pushed away from thermal equilibrium, either by work or measurement. Everyone knows it can be done with work, with batteries and so on, but perhaps it's less familiar that measurement will also enable you to push a system away from equilibrium and build a clock. At finite temperature, the fluctuation dissipation theorem implies a limit to clock accuracy. Uh, at zero temperature, the measurement noise plays the role of thermal noise, and you need to think carefully about what measurement you make to extract the clock signal. Uh, but if you do that, the quantum noise leads to uh, irreducible phase diffusion in the measured clock signal. And as I've indicated uh, towards the end of the talk, that these ideas can be used to give a practical realization of Rabelli cone thermal time hypothesis. Uh, whether it solves the problem of time in quantum gravity, well, that's another matter entirely because we don't actually have a quantum theory of gravity, but it gives some nice hints. So, with that, I'll finish and happily answer any questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, sure. Gerard. That was a fascinating talk. Um, there's a few questions uh, in the uh, in the chat already, and I uh, invite anybody who wants to ask a question. Um, maybe I can start with a very naive question. Um, in the early part of your talk, this is just in the in the classical uh, conversation, uh, you mm -hmm. were talking about the fact that um, an essential characteristic of uh, of a of a realizable clock is the is the ability of the system uh, in the phase space to approach a limit cycle. And that, re that requires um, damping. Now, I just didn't quite. So um, it seems to it. It would seem to me, therefore, that the damping that you're talking about has to be, uh, if you like, in a sense, uh, in the neighbourhood in the in the phase space neighbourhood of the limit cycle itself. But what happens if the systems are, are more complicated, so that that's no longer so that that really <clears throat> manifests itself only as a local limit cycle can you have um what yep. what and, and then when you generalize from that to the quantum system does that become a problem the fact that there may yes. be more than one limit cycle which may in fact intersect uh, okay um so classically of course you can have multiple period limit cycles all with different basins of attraction i guess that's that's what you're you're you're, you're referring to Yes. Uh, the example I gave is just linear dissipation, but of course it needn't be linear dissipation. So certainly you can have multiple periodicities. In fact, you can have period doubling bifurcations going all the way to chaos. I think the simplest answer is that if you build a system that had that sort of behavior, it wouldn't be a very good clock. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it would be very interesting. <laughs> be very so uh, there are lots of uh, electronic clocks that, that are just, just a little step away from uh, being chaotic. Yes, uh, ah. generally not a desirable thing. Uh, in the quantum case, ah, well, now we're into a really interesting question about quantum chaos. And um, so if a system, again, it's the same argument, if there are multiple period limit cycles, when you quantize it, you're just not going to get a very good clock. That's what's mm. going to happen. You get a very interesting system, but it won't be a very good clock. Right, okay. Um, uh, in the chat, I think you could probably just uh, read them. Let me scroll up, see what the first question is. So, maybe you can read them out to me. Yes, can you say? Yeah, so Andrew, um, uh, Andrew Allison says you'd like to read more about the proposition that all coordinates are just methods to keeping track of coincidences. Could you please explain uh, something about this or offer some suggestions uh, yes. for the reading? Well, the best, the best place to read about it is Carlo Rivelli's book on quantum gravity, where he discusses it in excruciating detail, uh, including the classical case, as well as the general relativistic case. Uh, uh, says a few things about the quantum case. Uh, that's the best place to read about it. So um, I could say more about it, but, but I'll just leave it there so that I can get to some other questions here as well. Yeah. Igor wants to know, is, is it right to say, therefore, the time is an emergent quantity? once there are coincidences to be observed. Yeah, that's okay. So this is now getting a little philosophical. So it's an old question of, of whether uh, everything changes or nothing changes. So uh, mm. clocks, of course, uh, if nothing is changing, then there's just one coincidence and nothing, and that's the end of it. So there is no clock and there is no time. Mm. Um, so in some sense, I guess, as soon as you have systems which can change time as measured by clocks is emergent. 
But I'd like to stress that it's only local. It will only ever emerge locally. Well, one of the things that uh, Ravelli has talked about from time to time in public lectures and so forth is the origin of the concept of a now um, and whether mm -hmm. the concept of a now is in some sense universal or is it purely relational. Uh, I mean, um, this is getting a bit f uh, philosophical as well. And one of the beautiful thing about the talk you just gave is that it was so tightly tied to um, physics. But does any of this that you think have any impact on our uh, concept of time in terms of the concept of now? I mean, one of the problems of, th of thermodynamic um, concepts of time based on entropy and so forth was that it, it seems to me it was difficult to define the concept of now in, in those systems. Um, do you have any comment about that? Okay, so, yeah, well, because clocks are always local and time is always local, now is always local. So even in special relativity, we know now is always local. Um, some other observer moving at constant speed with respect to, with, with respect to us, we have a different notion of now. Mm. So now is always local, both in special relativity and general relativity. Um, so what, what does that mean? Well, imagine you had three or four clocks now here, uh, and you synchronize them so they all have a count of zero when some event happens in the external world. And now uh, you just start looking at coincidences between counts of the clock and this external event happening. So one clock may count 10, ah, external event happens. Another clock may count 11 when the same external event happens because the clocks are necessarily noisy. So even though you can synchronize an initial now, they'll all start to disagree about the future. Uh, the argument can be run exactly the same way into the past as well. Uh, I can so ask, well, now I've synchronized all the clocks to a particular event, but if I look at all the previous records before now, they'll also begin to diverge. And on this simple idea, you can quickly show that entropy has to increase into the future and into the past from now which is you know, a well understood idea it goes back to Boltzmann and, and, and in Reichenbach. The other important philosophical aspect of this, which I'm working on with a colleague in philosophy at UQ, Pete Evans, is that there's been a discussion in philosophy about what is the difference between physical time, the T in the equations of physics, mm -hmm. and manifest time, which is the time we feel, which yeah. flows, now is special, uh, we forget. Uh, but once you link um, learning and memory to physical clocks, you quickly see that the only physical time is in fact manifest time. And uh, we're trying to finish a paper on that, hopefully by the end of the year uh, for a, um, well, I guess one would hope some philosophy journal. But yes, certainly thinking about the physics of clocks has a direct bearing on many old philosophical questions about the nature of time. Oh, that's fascinating, yeah. Um, there's a question here from Eric Street asking, does this work suggest new practical architectures that experimentalists could be considering? Example, going back toward uh, maser type active systems, um, uh, interrogating <laughs> atomic ensembles and comparing versus flywheel oscillators, for example. Yes, absolutely. It certainly does. So already NIST is trying to build a superconducting laser clock, um, which we'll have a narrower line with. And as I hinted at, there may be ways of engineering the local interaction between the system and its environment, perhaps using a squeeze bath to get better quantum clocks than we currently have just relying on ordinary or spontaneous emission. Right. So yes, the answer to Eric's question is most definitely yes. I haven't got anything practical to suggest to do right now, but uh, it's, on, it's on the agenda. So here's a more controversial question uh, from Peter Riggs. Is it your view that the, sub that the substantive view of general relativity must be correct. I think he's referring to the must fact that you must be correct. I think he's referring to the fact that you were talking about ah. general relativity in relation to clocks and um, are those yeah. two intimately related, I think is the uh, essence of the question. Yeah. So I think that's a good question, Peter. Um, so it's related to an old debate of whether space time is substantival or not. Mm -hmm. um, General relativity sort of sits somewhere on the boundary between yes and no to that question. Um, but if one focuses on physical events that define general relativity, that is local coincidences, local rulers, local coincidences, then what matters are the physical events themselves. Uh, they are certainly sub substantive. 
and, and presumably there's going to be an intimate relationship then when you go when you um generalize from classical time classical time measurement to quantum time measurement and you try to marry that with the concept of simultaneity which you know forms such an essential basis for the special theory of relativity do you think mm -hmm. that um the intrinsic nature of the um uh, accuracy with which we can measure time has a bearing on concepts such as the definition of simultaneity um yes it probably does um uh, you know the notion of an inertial frame is only approximate in any case mm. the frame is inertial over some region of space and for some duration of time mm. so there'll always be a question of if i make the time the clock's better and better and the rule is better and better my inertial frames may shrink to some very small local region of space time which is essentially what general relativity says mm. uh, yeah so so when you actually think about testing simultaneity in the physics of special relativity, you have to have clocks, clocks and rules, and these are necessarily mm. noisy devices, even in the quantum case. But let me also just quickly pick up on something you said. Of course, quantum clocks are one thing, but the measurement record you get out is perfectly classical. It just mm. counts. Yeah. There's nothing quantum about that, mm. apart from the fact that it's an integer. So this you know, raises the, the thorny issue of the relationship between the quantum structure of the universe and observed events in the measurement problem. Mm. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you very much, Gerard. I don't think there are any more questions. Um, so let me again uh, thank you on behalf of everybody. And I will remind everyone that if you want to watch Gerard's talk again within a few days, it'll be up on the uh, AIP YouTube channel. Just do a search Australian Institute of Physics YouTube and you'll find that very quickly. Um, and the previous talks have been uh, uploaded there as well. Uh, thank you once again, Gerard, and thank you everybody for joining the seminar. It was an extremely interesting talk. Great. Thanks, David. Thank you.